Okay, today we want to talk a little bit about the kinetics of phase transformations. And we're going to begin, uh, at least in this section, just talking about a brief introduction to nucleation. So there are basically three categories of uh, phase transformations that we want to uh, consider. Uh, the first is just a simple diffusion-dependent transformation. Um, and, and this would be an example of uh, uh, solidification. So if you have uh, molten metal and it, you're turning it into a solid, this would be example, an example of simple diffusion-dependent transformation. Basically, it's, it's, it's diffusion-mediated. Namely, that means that we have to migrate the particles uh, from the liquid phase, let's say, into the solid phase. Uh, but the number of phases and the phase composition doesn't change. So at the beginning, we still we had a solid phase with a particular composition. At the end, or sorry, a liquid phase with a particular composition. And at the end, we have a solid phase with a particular composition that's the same as the liquid phase. So that's a simple diffusion-dependent transformation. Then we have a more complex diffusion-dependent transformation, but it's still diffusion-mediated. Um, in this case, the number of phases and or the phase compositions uh, is, is going, are going to change. Uh, and an example of this would be a eutectoid reaction. Um, uh, what I'm showing you here is actually a eutectic reaction, but you can see the, the um, eutectic growth direction as the solid phase grows into the liquid phase. There's diffusion required from the liquid uh, into one phase or away from another phase. Uh, that would be a sort of one more level of complexity. And then finally, there's a type of transformation called a diffusionless transformation that proceeds without any diffusion. Um, and this typically forms a metastable phase. And we're going to see this uh, in the formation of martensite uh, in steels. So those are the three types that are uh, important to be aware of. Uh, we're going to talk today about a simple diffusion-dependent transformation, namely solidification of a pure metal uh, in, in just a little bit. Uh, most transformations or most phase transformations that we're going to encounter uh, occur via some process of nucleation and growth. Um, and nucleation is exactly like it sounds. It's the formation of some small particles or uh, a nuclei. And those are usually, it's usually on the order of hundreds of atoms of whatever new phase. So in the case of the simple uh, solidification that we're talking about, we're looking at um, the new phase would be the solid phase. Uh, the growth phase is just once those particles or the nuclei form, they're going to increase in size until whatever the equilibrium phase amount that's required is obtained. Um, I'm showing you here uh, uh, a picture uh, of a simulated nucleation and growth process. This is for uh, pure aluminum. And what you can see, in, and this is, these are times of the simulation, so 33 picoseconds, 48 picoseconds, 66 picoseconds, and 90 picoseconds. This is all done at 700 degrees Kelvin. But what you can see is in this early phase, you can see some nuclei starting to form, these little green spots. Uh, and at some later time, those nuclei have begun to grow. Here you go. And some other nuclei now have started to form. Further on in time, the, the growing nuclei continue to grow, and the new nuclei continue to grow. And then there are some, right here, some new nuclei that form. And that process continues until we get to a higher time, and, and uh, the growth continues, and so does the nucleation. So be aware that nucleation and growth uh, typically are occurring simultaneously. It's not one uh, and then the other, uh, except for at the at the particle phase, but in the in the process as a whole, nucleation is occurring at the same time that growth is occurring in other nuclei. So th those those are important uh, concepts to remember. <clears throat> uh, nucleation is going to be classified as either um, homogeneous nucleation, and all that means is that's what I just showed you in the previous slide, where the nuclei particles are going to form uniformly. Uh, in the parent phase, there's no there's no biasing of where they form. They just sort of form randomly in there. Uh, heterog heterogeneous nucleation occurs when the the uh, nuclear particles are going to form preferentially at structural inhomogeneities. And we we've already drawn that a little bit in the the uh, eutectoid transformation and microstructures for steel, where we said, well, probably we're going to nucleate new phases at the grain boundaries, and that would be an example of heterogeneous nucleation. 
uh, or they could nucleate other impurities, particulates, surfaces, dislocations, anything that causes um, basically a location of higher energy, uh, those particles can form at. So uh, those are the two classifications of nucleation. I'm just showing you a picture of that here. Uh, in the homogeneous case, we have to form a cluster of atoms sort of in a random fashion, and then that uh, th this is this is for vapor, but the idea is the same. Then that acts as basically a, its own nuclei that then can grow. In heterogeneous nucleation, there's some uh, we'll call it in this case they're showing you a foreign particle, but some particulate, and the the new phase is going to grow on the surface of that particulate, and then form uh, the the uh, the nucleus from which growth will occur. So those are the two types: homogeneous nucleation and heterogeneous nucleation. Okay, now we're going to get a little bit more technical. We're going to talk about um, the homogeneous nucleation uh, of a pure metal. So this is going to be a solidification process that uh, during cooling, and it's going to result in some particle. So we want to think through the just the process uh, and and try to understand the the math that's behind it. So obviously, for some temperature less than the melting temperature. Uh, the formation of a solid phase within the liquid is going to lower the free energy, at least within the volume where the transformation occurred, right? Because if it's below the melting temperature, then it, the equilibrium state is to have um, is, is to have the uh, solid phase, not the liquid phase. But uh, whenever we form that solid, there's going to be a new liquid-solid interface that's going to cause the free energy to increase. Okay, so. We can write the total change in the Gibbs free energy for the system by saying that it's the sum of the reduction that we get uh, in the Gibbs free energy of the volume plus the increase that we have from in the Gibbs free energy of the surface. Okay, so let's go ahead and explore that just a little bit more. Uh, so this is just uh, from the previous slide showing you what the total Gibbs free energy is in the system. And if we assume that that there's a change in Gibbs free energy per unit volume, we'll call it delta G sub V, uh, that results just from the phase transformation process and the fact that it's it exists as a, at a lower Gibbs free energy because it's we're now below the melting temperature, then we can compute the Gibbs free energy change due to the volume uh, uh, changing to a solid. And that's just the volume of the particle. In this case, we're assuming a spherical particle. So the volume of the particle is 4 thirds pi r cubed times uh, delta g sub v, which is just the free energy change per unit volume because of the phase transformation. OK, so just remember that because delta g sub v is less than 0, right, it reduces the Gibbs free energy, then delta g in the volume must be less than 0. OK, so for the surface energy gamma, uh, we may write that uh, the delta G of the surface here is going to be equal to the surface area of, this, of the particle, which is 4 pi r squared, times the, the, uh, the surface energy gamma, which is a, actually a per unit area uh, quantity. And then because gamma is greater than 0, then delta G of the surface is going to be greater than 0. Um, and then we can write again, uh, going back to this this top equation here, we can write again that the total change in the Gibbs free energy can be written in, in this form here where we have the contribution from the volume and the contribution from the surface. Okay, so that's the total change in the Gibbs free energy. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward. So let's begin with that. And let's just ask some basic questions about uh, what we could expect from this equation. Well. Obviously, if r equals 0, then delta g equals 0, right? That's straightforward. You can plug, look at the equation and plug that in. Uh, if r is very small, then r cubed is going to be much, much less than r squared. So delta g is actually going to be positive initially. So we start out with delta g 0. We go to delta g is positive, and that's because we're actually increasing the energy due to the surface uh, uh, energy and the the energy reduction we get for the volume isn't sufficient to overcome that surface energy, but at some point for very for r large enough, then the r cube term or the volume term is going to dominate the r squared term, so delta g goes back to less than zero. Okay, what that I hope what that hopefully says to you is that there must exist some maximum in the Gibbs free energy delta g. Let's call it delta g star such that delta G star is going to act as an activation energy for nucleation. 
Okay, so here's the here's the diagram. Uh, this this red curve is the is the the Gibbs free energy that's a result of uh, the surface. This blue curve is the Gibbs free energy that is a result of of the volume. And if we add them together, we end up with actually something that begins at zero, ramps up to some value, and then dives off as the radius gets large enough. Okay, so uh, we're going to try to we're going to try to look at uh, how we can how we can compute this delta G star because that's how much energy we have to overcome to actually create uh, a particle that's stable. Um, the radius uh, at which that occurs, so this is R star, uh, is going to be called the critical nucleation radius, and it might be tempting to say, well. Maybe, maybe the critical radius should be where delta G equals zero. But really what we want is we just want it such that any increased growth from R star is going to uh, cause a reduction in the Gibbs free energy of the system. So we just need to figure out where, uh, where R star occurs such that any growth above there uh, is going gonna, is gonna to allow the particle to grow stably. Okay? So how do we figure out that? Well... We know that uh, R star occurs when delta G is a maximum. Uh, and so we just need to figure out where delta G is a maximum. We do that by taking the derivative with respect to R and setting it equal to zero. We end up solving, uh, you can do a little bit of algebra on it, uh, and end up seeing that it's just R delta G V plus two gamma. Uh, so then we can easily solve that for uh, solve for r, which gives us r star, and see that r star is going to be negative 2 times gamma divided by uh, delta gv. Okay, uh, We can then use r star uh, to compute delta g star. Uh, delta g star then ends up being 16 pi over 3 uh, times gamma cubed over delta gv squared. And this term is going to become important in the next lecture as we talk about what, what controls the the change in the um, the volume term of the Gibbs free energy on a per unit volume basis. That, that will be the focus of our next lecture. But the upshot of all of this is that in order to create a, a stable nuclei from which to grow a new phase, we have to overcome an activation energy barrier of delta G star, and we have to form a nuclei with uh, a radius of at least R star. Uh, hopefully that's straightforward. But there still is one question that remains, and it's kind of critical to talking about uh, uh, the relationship of time to phase transformations, and that is how fast will the nucleation progress? So that's going to be the topic of our next lecture. Um, hopefully this was straightforward and you understand the concepts of uh, some definitions with respect to nucleation, but also this idea of a critical radius that's, that's required to form the nuclei, as well as the activation energy that's required to be overcome in order to form that nucleus.